Welcome to History of High Noon 2023. This is our first one. It's going to be a good one, too. One of my favorite people's here. An announcement to make. Uh, Howard Gray is going to be in concert February 4th at 630 it's uh, music really of the past through music and song at D Douglas Goffin Country Club. It's $10 per group of four, and the proceeds go to Childhood Awareness Group, Childhood Cancer Awareness Group. I always leave out a seat somewhere. But anyway, that's it. Um, next week, we open up a new exhibit at schools, 1870 to 1970. And it's been a real interesting look back at some of the things that we have found and people have brought to us and I hope you'll all come back and or come by through and look at it when we get it up. But today you have one of my favorite people, this man. Chris Trowell was a history book. This man is a culture guru. I cannot say it any clearer than that. He is culture, he is a naturalist, he is the most informed young man, and I can say that because I'm way older than he is, and I am just so pleased that he's a friend of mine. Chris Adams. Thank you. Now, she didn't tell me she was going to flatter me before I got up here and talked to you all this morning. And I asked her just a while ago, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about specifically? And I, I said, you just want me to climb on my soapbox? She said, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do for you all today. But... It's a privilege to be here and talk with y'all this morning, and hopefully after our conversation, you might gain a little knowledge of something you didn't know after this, but my family, I always like to start talking about my family, because with native people, with indigenous people here, you usually ask them who they are, or where they're from, or who are you, they don't give you their name right away. They tell you their clan, their family, and you know, Anglo culture used to be like that too. You say, well, I'm so-and-so's people. Well, my Adams bunch has been here in Coffee County since before it was Coffee County. In fact, one of my uh, paternal grandfathers, William Riley Adams, settled between the Satilla River and the community of Fales back around 1830s. So my family's been here a while. And I go by the title a cracker. Let me first introduce you to what a cracker is. Today it is viewed as a derogatory term, if used incorrectly. Hundred years ago that was not the case. Now, you gotta go all the way back to the 1500s before we get started with telling you about the here and now version of that word. William Shakespeare in his play King John in 1594, he says, what craker is this who deefs our ears with abundant and superfluous breath? He's basically saying, who is this that won't hush up? They were braggarts, boasters, lively talkers, and storytellers. That's synonymous with anybody you would call a cracker nowadays, because they can spin a yarn a mile long. But as time went on in the 1700s, we start to see a wave of settlers come into this region, one of the first, towards the end of the American Revolution. And Governor Wright, I believe it was, of Georgia, he sends a letter to somebody and he says, these crackers are a lawless set of rascals. And then another person says, we tell them where to settle and they don't. We tell them we're not to settle and they do. So now we're talking illegal immigrants. They were jumping over the line of what was then Spanish Florida. Well, by the 1850s, this sort of honorable version of the word comes along. Uh, these people were known for driving large herds of cattle back and to across the range, the wiregrass range, and we'll get into that in a minute too. But some townswoman might be standing out there and say, well, here come those crackers again. They'd hear the long, platted cow whips. Eventually, the name just became a badge of honor, someone who'd been in one place for a long period of time. And I regard myself as that. I'm as much a native to South Georgia as some of the plants and the animals are, in my opinion. And my family, they came here in humble means. Some of my family came from Duplin County, North Carolina. And back in the 1750s, it was considered backcountry. By the early 1800s, when they started to leave North Carolina and come into Georgia, about the time of the land lotteries, these people settled in what were then just plain old log cabin dwelling houses. They had stick and mud chimneys, this being the 1830s and 40s. At that same time in Duplin County, that would be Kenansville, people were building frame houses and had brick chimneys. They were living in upscale dwellings. 
When people use the word primitive, we use it nowadays almost as a, as a vile term. When something is primitive, it's outdated. In my opinion, being primitive is being simple, and simplicity is one of the greatest virtues there is in life to have. If you keep it simple, it works easy, right? It's worked for hundreds of years for certain people. It'll work for us still today. And I put on Facebook, I, I do some dealings with uh, the Georgia Folk and Farm Life page on Facebook. It's got 85,000 members and posted yesterday about the plant mullen. Any of y'all familiar with the mullen plant? Mullen looks like a lamb's ear. It's a big, green, bushy plant. It used to be used in herbal cures, folk medicine. Nowadays, you ask somebody to identify it, they about can't tell you what it looks like, where it grows. And it's not native here, but it's so common around old home places because women used to plant that in the herb gardens and use it for cures to, you know, for the family. But something as simple as knowing that is falling out of favor nowadays. Tradition has fallen by the wayside, and especially with young people like myself, I'll be 26 come April. I'm not an old bird. <laughs> but I have a knowledge because my family was brought up differently. My grandfather, when he was born, uh, his first home was a Reconstruction era log house. They continued to plow with mules until the 1970s. They had an outhouse. I don't believe they had running water until probably 1968. And that's fairly recent when you start to think about it. That ain't that long ago. But that was the norm for people over half a century ago. Some of y'all in here probably remember that. Growing up, maybe drawing water from a well. But you try to tell people my age that today, it seems foreign to them. They don't view that as their culture. And that's what I want to talk about to y'all today is culture. I have often talked about the wiregrass region, this small little area of South Georgia here. And it's an imaginary line that's drawn around it. It goes from the eastern edge of Okefenokee up to the Okmulgee River, slants off into southeastern Alabama, and encompasses most of northeastern Florida. It is a very isolated region, or was at one time. There are still portions of it today which is virtual nothingness if you don't know what to look for, just trees and bushes. You go south of Okefenokee, there ain't nobody lives down there for 40 miles on the bottom of the swamp. But it was through this isolation that the early pioneers that came here, they sort of had a time capsule. Songs that their people had sung, phrases that their people had used, words even that we still use today. Uh, I got stumped. I used to work over in Albany at Chihaw Zoo, and you wouldn't believe how much of a difference there is just crossing a river talking with a number of people. And I would say something, and one of my coworkers would look at me and be like, what did you just say? Well, uh, one particular example I'll give you, when it's cool and breezy outside, it's Irish outside. That is an old Scots-Irish word right there. <laughs> Nobody uses that outside of this little region or the region of Appalachia. That's because the isolation kept it here. It kept it in the vogue. But today, uh, a lot of our language is falling out of favor. It is not prim or proper to speak the way some of us do. And an excellent book I'll recommend is Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, written by a good friend of mine, Janice Ray. If you've never read it, you should read it and get an insight into what it's like to grow up like that, though some of you have grown up like that. But Culture is the essence of a people. It is who we are. It is our identity. And if you lose your culture and your traditions, you lose your identity. And some might say, well, making a, a straw broom in South Georgia is no different than making a straw broom up in Appalachia. Y'all know what I'm talking about, a straw broom. Maybe some old timer had a peculiar way of tying it off or bunching it together. But something as simple as that makes all the difference to cultural meaning. The Cherokees, they make baskets different than the Seminole people. The Seminole people make baskets different than the Homa people in Louisiana. The Native American people on this continent make baskets different than the people in West Africa. Is it still a basket? Yeah. But they're different. They are distinct and unique in their own special way because of the makers. And that is what I deem important about South Georgia culture and heritage is 
Some may say that we are not distinct or unique, but it was that isolation that kept it unique. It kept it different. And I try to share that with people everywhere I go. And this is going to be brief today, me talking about some of these things with y'all. But I do living history programs. I go into schools and fairs and festivals and historic sites. And sometimes I will dress out in 1800s clothing down to the last stitch. I mean, I, I take extra care in trying to present myself in the way some of my ancestors did to give people a better idea, a better grasp at that knowledge of the things that they had to go through uh, the things that they witnessed. You know, you can talk about history all the day long, but unless you live a part of it, you really don't know. And that's the upper hand I have is I've lived and done a lot of the things that I talk about, whether it be plowing mules, making straw brooms, making baskets. It's because I wanted to grasp that knowledge myself so I could share it with others. And in teaching, you learn things sometimes. You learn how things are supposed to work. Uh, building log cabins and things. You look at the little examples and the handiwork of certain number of people, each person had a different way of doing things. But I started in winter of 21, the Wiregrass Ecological and Cultural Project. I wanted to make, put it out there to where people could easily access information about our ancestors, our forebears here. And there's a page on Facebook, if any of you are on Facebook, you can go to it and find it pretty easily. But a part of my work is not just telling people about history, it is literally growing history. And what I mean by that, heirloom seeds. That is one of the most tangible links to the past that we have, is the very crop that people grew 100 years ago, 200 years ago. <laughs> and I have desperately searched high and low across this area of Georgia and North Florida uh, to find seeds left by families or passed on. And it makes my stomach churn to think in the last 50 years how many have been lost because of negligence. Not passing it on or in fact passing it on and the children or the grandchildren not taking an interest in it. And we've lost a lot of that. Uh, heritage is not just things that are talked about, it's the tangible stuff. And I have a corn right now that there may be five people in the state of Georgia growing at the moment. I'm making that seed available to people to get it out there, get it back in the hands of South Georgia, or South Georgians, but it was grown by native people here over 200 years ago as a white flint corn. I've got peas, uh, even a tobacco strain that was grown 140 something years ago. It was the first flu cured tobacco grown here in South Georgia. But these are things that we can pass on, that we can make available again to people to share not only in the history, but to have something tangible that's usable. You have to make these things viable for people to be interested. There has to be some usage for it, otherwise nobody's going to want it, right? Another thing are heritage breeds. I have been very fortunate over the last several years to work with the livestock that some of our ancestors had. Piney Woods cattle, the, the rake straw cows, some of the old timers call them. Native sheep, the Gulf Coast sheep that used to be here. Farmers used to have hundreds, if not thousands, of sheep across South Georgia. And there's somewhat of a resurgence nowadays, but you don't see near as many sheep as you used to. Spanish goats, or the briar goats, they used to call them. I raise these things, and with the hope of one day having somewhat of an archive, this menagerie of mine, to incorporate into a learning center. That's the future goal. But right now, the here and now is putting it out there for people to share, to get a knowledge and get a grasp of. But that's my side gig, I guess you'd call it. My, my day job, I'm the interpreter, the interpretive ranger out there at General Coffee State Park. I got hired on in September. I know many of you have been to the park, have grown up around the park, seen it from its beginning, and you've seen a lot of changes. There have been a lot of things that probably should have been done better or might have been done a little, little better. But we're working on gaining that historical integrity of the place, trying to revamp it. You'll notice some changes going on if you go out there now because I'm working on the heritage garden, the heirloom garden we've got. You'll see a complete garden this spring with nothing but local crops growing in it. We're working on trying to get the right livestock out there again to give a better image of what life was like here. 
And as far as the buildings, we're also doing routine maintenance to them. And got a few cultural events coming up too. I belong to a little clique of reenactor and living historians and we travel all over the southeast, but we've been putting together some really good events these last several years. Places like the Okefenokee all the way to Alapaha. But we've been doing a pretty good job of trying to spread the message of preservation out there for our people in this region. <coughs> Ms. Carroll, do you have any questions for me perhaps? What kind of changes have you made in the frontier part of the Right now, one thing you'll notice is the availability of a ranger being in some of the cabins. Uh, the Meeks cabin that we have out there at the park, it was built around 1831. <laughs> it is one of, if not the oldest dwelling house, log dwelling house in all this area of Georgia. And I have went inside that, we've cleaned it out, and we've got it back to what it may have looked like in about 1874 when Reverend Malcolm Meeks moved in there with his family and raised 12 children out of it. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions about anything I'm doing out at the park? Or anything I'm doing at the house? <laughs> I'll be glad to answer anything. Are you employed by the Department of Natural Resources? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Technically, I am a park ranger through the state of Georgia working out there. My son was a park ranger for three years mm -hmm. uh, up at um, Sweetwater Creek State Park. Oh, yeah, that's a pretty park and up there. And he was at Fort Mountain State Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, he left the park services to go to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And he is employed uh, by Department of Natural Resources over around Pembroke, Georgia, I believe. But I've told people this since he started working there, and you know, with the park services, because mm -hmm. that's how he got on first. That is the best kept secret in the state of Georgia. Oh, yes, it is. You can go stay there a lot cheaper. There's people there on duty at these places, and they will show you things. When he was there at, um, at uh, Sweetwater Creek State Park, they filmed four movies there. And for a boy that grew up in Kingsland, Georgia, to be a bodyguard for mm -hmm. John Travolta, and <laughs> what is that guy's name? He is a tremendous actor, but he's a knucklehead. Uh, I can't think he played in. That's a lot of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they would put, they would call game boards and stuff in, and they would be assigned. Mm -hmm. uh, De Niro, Robert De Niro. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, he said Travolta was the most friendly guy I'd ever met, that uh, De Niro was paranoid. Uh, when they asked him, uh, uh, Mr. De Niro asked my son, you know, what he thought about being his bodyguard, and he said, he, he said, don't you know, you know, do, do you want to know why I chose you? He said, you can tell me, sir. He said, first of all, when we were out there talking, your back was up against a tree and you were looking all the time. And second of all, you had a gun. And, you know, uh, but the Hunger Games, that fort, the old mill down there, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that the Union troops would send the people from Georgia up to Indiana to prison camps. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, they would work up there. But, uh, uh, a lot of them didn't have passage back home after that either. A lot of them had to stay up there. Yes, sir. We have another question back here. All right. Are you doing a flower garden? We are, yes, ma'am. So it's funny you mention that. I was actually going to talk about the flowers here in just a second. But at my house, so this is where I've got a lot of this I'm drawing from. I have plants and things at the house that I can take cuttings from or seeds from and put right out there at the park. But one thing I do every spring. Uh, I drive around back roads, dirt roads, anywhere I can find, and remnants of old home places. You see a well or a big pecan tree or a cedar tree somewhere, and there's usually a daffodil or a paper white or something growing there. And that is one of the things, I don't take them all. I like seeing them when I ride around, but I will take one or two just out of the ditch right there, as close as I can get, and I'll take them home because what that to me represents is a lady whether she was a pioneer herself or whether she was the descendant of pioneers, 
Those may have been flowers that she took cuttings from or bulbs from that belonged to her mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. And to me, the flower itself even represents the enduring pioneer spirit of these people. Because a hundred years after the house is gone, the flowers still grow. And I've got right now, uh, one of the things that used to be very popular on wiregrass homesteads were gardenias. And they called them Cape Jasmine back then. They didn't call them gardenias. And my girlfriend's family has one that has been passed down since her great-grandmother, I believe, or great-great-grandmother. And it could easily go back to the 1870s. So it is one of the few documented Cape Jasmines that were here way back when. So I'm taking very, very special care in taking these same plants and incorporating them out there at the park. But not only at the park, at my house too. What are some of the, I know you do the talks at the park, what are some of the topics you've covered? As of recent, turpentining, which I am an absolute nut for, uh, I'm one of the few people, I guess, that still help and assist with the only remaining fire steel, turpentine steel in the state of Georgia, the Agrama, or the Museum of Agriculture as it's called now. Every April, we do the Georgia Folklife Festival over there, and we'll run a, a gum charge through the steel. Last year, I sheared sheep. We'll be doing that again out there at General Coffee this year. And I did a program most recently on General John Coffee who this county and who the park are named after. <coughs> One other thing I was going to mention real quick, you, you mentioned the Civil War, I wanted to point this out too. Here in Coffee County and most of the Wiregrass region, outsiders and scholars and a lot of history books just kind of brush over this region because they don't think anything went on here. If you go about 25, 30 miles to the west of here, where Confederate President Jefferson Davis is captured, right outside of Irwinville, Georgia. People talk about the Civil War ending in Virginia or North Carolina with General Johnson. Civil War ended right there in Irwinville, Georgia because the Confederate government ceased to be when uh, President Jefferson Davis was captured. And another thing, uh, after the Civil War, talking about isolation of a region, a federal troop came through Douglas, or said to have come through Douglas, just after the war's end. And at that time, there was not much in Douglas. In fact, the courthouse is said to have turned into a goat stall at that time. But there was a store, I believe it was owned by Sheriff Spivey at the time, and he was sitting out on his front porch. This troop of Yankees comes up, and they ask him, uh, Sir, can you point us in the direction of Douglas? And it said, he looked north, south, east, and west, and looked back at the officer asking him this, and he said, well, sir, you're standing in it. And they threatened to hang him right there for a lying rebel traitor, because they didn't believe they were in Douglas. Their maps evidently showed Douglas, and they thought, well, this must be a good place to resupply before they made their way on to Valdosta. Anyhow, they didn't hang the man, and, well, that tells you the shape of Douglas at that time. It was not until the railroads came through about the 1890s that Douglas was re-established into the booming metropolis we have now today. I hear we're getting a Publix, right? Yeah. Yeah. We high dollar now. No more Dollar Generals. Do you have um, volunteers that help like in your flower garden and stuff like that? Occasionally we do, and uh, I'll be glad to talk with any of y'all. If y'all want to come out there to the park and help, volunteer hours, I will be more than glad to have you out there helping me. Anybody else? You have a few carnivorous plants there. Want to tell you anything about them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that kind of goes with the ecological part of my interest. Uh, the wiregrass region not only is culturally significant, but it is ecologically important. We have places like the Broxton Rocks just up the road, which you have species of lichens that don't grow anywhere else in the world except for down here. The Okmulgee River and the Altamaha River, the Altamaha is considered Georgia's Amazon. It's one of the most biodiverse regions in the state. Okie Finoki, we got 400,000 uh, acres of wildlife refuge down there complete with about 12 to 15,000 alligators, all sorts of wildlife species that you will not find in any abundance more than what you find in the Okefenokee. And then right here in Coffee County in this area, you got Sand Hill ecosystems. So we got all these little biodiverse hotspots. Well, one of my interests are carnivorous plants. 
The old timers used to call them fly traps and fly catchers, but they're not a Venus fly trap. That involves the movement, you know. The hooded pitcher plant or yellow or green pitcher plant is trumpet-like, and it has a sticky little substance down on the bottom that draws insects into it. The insect goes in, it gets trapped, and of course that becomes nutrients for the plant. But they are considered rare in many places in Georgia, and we got quite a few out there at the park, and actually re-establishing a bog area not far from my office building there. The state of Georgia is relocating or transplanting pitcher plants that are taken off of mine sites and uh, places where they're developing. They're getting them out of those places and bringing them to places where they can reincorporate them into a natural ecosystem. So we've got that going on at the park. And even at my house, I actually maintain a pitcher plant bog. I practice prescribed burns. You know, yearly farmers used to burn off the woods here in South Georgia. The native people uh, employed usage of fire, clearing off woodland, so greenery would come back and game would be much better the next year. But today, I hate to say it, Smokey the Bear has made a real dent on things. The only you can prevent wildfire slogan helped to prevent wildfires, but it also helped to prevent fires from any kind. And what happened is, you know, we humans, we hear something, we we get an inch, we take it a mile sometimes. Fire's bad, we ain't gonna burn at all. So you see the state of our woodlands now. We got duff layers three feet deep in some areas. And what happens when a wildfire comes through then? You got all that fuel that kills every tree there. But when you have a natural ecosystem that burns like it has for thousands of years, those trees will come back and do better. The understory will do better. Game will come back like quail and wild turkey. So we're also maintaining some of the natural areas out there at the park, like the pitcher plant bog and the upland pine savanna that we have remnants left of. So we're making that our goal, to keep that on the, on the table. Anybody else got a question? Thank you, Chris. It's oh, been absolutely. Wonderful. I wish you could come every, week, every month. <laughs> well, I'd be here if you wanted me here. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and we hope you come back next month. Thank you all.